Okay, our last and final presenter for today is Ryan Glassman. And Ryan will be talking to us about his research with Ayumi Fujisaki Manome and Abby Hudson. There you are, Ryan. And I believe we, we are not able to hear you, I don't think. All right. right yes, we, we can hear you now. Okay. Yeah, awesome. Just hold on one minute. Yes, yeah, so as Mary mentioned, my name is Ryan Glassman and I worked on the long-term trend of winter storm frequency and intensity over the Great Lakes region. My two mentors were Dr. Ayumi Fujisaki Minome and Dr. Abby Hudson, who I'd like to thank for all of their help throughout this fellowship, their guidance and wisdom and answering my, answering my endless questions throughout the fellowship. And I'd also like to give some acknowledgements to Mary, Michelle, and Aubrey for making this fellowship run smoothly and being helpful and supportive throughout. To get things started, started, I want to focus on the background of this case, which was really evaluating the long-term trends in these winter storms from the fall of 1979 to the spring of 2021. And two things we wanted to do with this study are the first being examining the number of winter storms in the region. The second being measuring the intensity and frequency of these storms. And two things that we had to consider that were happening within the region are warmer temperatures in the Great Lakes region, especially warmer water temperatures, which have increased since the 1980s. And you can see those images on your right that are showing a slight increases in overall surface temperature of the water increasing as well, peaking around the late summer and fall. Additionally, we've also seen a reduction in ice during the winter months since the 1980s. Overall ice coverage has decreased. We've talked about this early on in this presentation. And two, some factors that we also have to consider meteorologically and climatologically are happening are the changes in the jet stream. The jet stream acts as a very fast moving column of wind at the upper levels of the atmosphere that tends to guide weather systems across the United States, and it has adopted a more northerly position, meaning that it's bringing in warmer air from the south, impacting areas from northern Ohio through northern Illinois. Additionally, we have been in a recent La Nina pattern, which means cooler and wetter winters in Great Lakes region. To consider those things, we had a better idea of how the atmosphere was sort of behaving during the period, this recent period. Our motivation was really to examine the changes in precipitation and the sea level pressure within the region. By understanding these changes, we could have a better understanding how some of these different storms tracked and developed in the region. Additionally, we wanted to focus in on our storm paths and focus in on more mesoscale and synoptic scale events. Mesoscale being more local and synoptic being more large scale in nature. And what we wanted to do was track these storms, plot them, and also observe the trajectory and the speed of these storms. By doing that, we could have a better idea of what specific parameters we were looking for for our storm detection, our storm tracking, and our storm statistics, which we will get into more detail later on. The image you see on your right is an image of mid-latitude cyclones, which is another word that we can use instead of winter storms. So three types of these systems do typically impact the region. The first one being an Alberta clipper, which comes from Alberta, Canada, and it tends to drop lighter amounts of snow across the region. While, while our Colorado lows and our Panhandle low, which is located in the Arklatex, tend to cause the most trouble during the winter time, dropping higher amounts of precipitation within the region. By understanding this, we have a very good idea of what specific data points we need to look at. So for our data analysis, we wanted to focus in on the Great Lakes region from Southern Canada through Northern Ohio through Northern Illinois was our area of focus. And to find the data we were looking for from October of 1979 through March of 2021, we wanted to use the European Centers for Medium Range Weather Forecast, which is the European weather model, which does a very good job storing different variables we were looking for. So the three variables we were looking for for the study are first, the wind speed and direction, the mean sea level pressure and temperature were very critical to understanding how to evaluate potential changes within mid-latitude cyclones, especially in the Great Lakes region. What we did with that data was that data was examine different case studies of famous winter storms that have impacted the region 
And a good example of that would be the 2011 Groundhog Day blizzard, which did cause quite a bit of headache, especially in the Chicagoland area and Northern Indiana. What we did with that, these case studies was evaluate potential problems with our data set and also collect parameters for storm detection and storm tracking as well. And an issue we did have with our data was it was sorted yearly and seasonally. What we wanted to do was have a more seasonal outlook by starting in the late fall and early spring. However, when downloading the data, it started with January and ended through December, which did not paint the whole picture of what we were looking for, for the seasonal averages, which could potentially affect the counting of cyclones and also make comparing the seasonal averages much more challenging in the future. After learning that, what we needed to do now was focus in on our synoptic and mesoscale systems. Previous studies have only focused in on the large scale weather systems. What we wanted to do was incorporate both large scale and small scale systems. To do that, we needed an algorithm that could do both. Eric Oliver created a storm tracking algorithm, which we found using the GitHub repository. It did a very good job of providing our mean sea level pressure, the storm plots, and the storm tracks. What it also did was determine the locations and the paths of these storms, also providing the mean sea level pressure values. Additionally, it also plotted multiple points, which you can see on the first image on the top, you can see multiple points. Those red dots are areas of high pressure or anti-cyclones. And then off the North Carolina coast, you can see multiple blue dots, which is our cyclones that we were focusing on. So a filter was developed to prevent this problem because there was multiple data points and we were deeply concerned that the algorithm was gonna miscount these storms as, as multiple instead of it being one storm. And it kept inappropriately identifying storms when no storm was detected. To alleviate that, we developed a filter that focused in on the minimum mean sea level pressure value, which focused on the lowest value within the center of the cyclone. And this helped us better improve our data analysis. And you can see that on the bottom image, just that one point, that was the weather system that just exited the east, moving up the east coast. It was a nor'easter. And you can see that in with one of our other case studies. This was the December 11th through 14th winter storm. And you can see all those red dots on the first image here and just how disorganized it was and how the algorithm had a really hard time identifying which areas were high pressure and low pressure. When the filter was applied, it did a good job showing these two systems impacting the Great Lakes region. So after the filter was applied, we can have a better idea of how the storm behaved as it exited the region. So after ironing those things out, we needed to now decide on what parameters we needed to do and conduct some trials using the data. Over 20, about 20 trials were conducted and parameters were adjusted from length and duration were two things we considered as well. And also we wanted to consider the presence of synoptic and mesoscale systems. We, for the time duration aspect, for the minimum time duration, we did it from 12 hours up to 96 hours. Closer to 96 hours, what we kept finding was it tended to plot more synoptic scale systems and totally missed a majority of the mesoscale systems in the area. Area And the majority of the trials we found tended to include more synoptic scale systems, which was not the intention of, these, of this research. 24 hours did a very good job of incorporating both mesoscale and synoptic scale systems as well. For the length of the cyclones, which was very important, it ranged from as small as 50 kilometers all the way up to 500. Closer to 500, it totally missed the more lake effect events and the local events. So 150 was picked because it did a much better job of including these lake effect snow events. A third variable we also considered was the mean sea level pressure, which was 990 millibars or less for more stronger cyclones, which made data analysis much easier when we had to break that down further into more intense cyclones and the number of total detected systems. So now we're gonna compare some of the trials. So this was our very first trial at 72 hours and 500 kilometers. And you can see the image on your left, it's predominantly large scale weather systems. It totally misses the more smaller scale systems that the Great Lakes is notorious for. The image on your right, trial 15, was by far our winner. 
it had a combination of large and small scale systems, and you can totally see the night and day difference between these two. After conducting these different trials, we needed to count the data, which tended to be the most difficult part because there's a lot of storms in the region. So we decided to create a box to isolate the Great Lakes region. It's very similar to the area of the image shown by NASA, that satellite loop. And what the box did was help measure the total number of storms per season. And what we did further was list the mean sea level pressure values. And we wanted it to sort it by year to see how many of systems were in a given year. And if so, what were their mean sea level pressure values? And it was done this way to evaluate potential errors in the data set and potentially understand why we were getting certain outliers within the data. So the goal was really to have a wider range of information and also examine why have these storms changed over time and how has the frequency been impacted was the other thing we were examining. So after finding the total number of storms, we wanted to break that data down further per year. So we broke it down into two categories, the first one being the total number of detected storms, the other one being winter storms less than 990 millibars or less. After we got it down into two categories, it made conducting data analysis much easier. So after sorting the data into our two categories, we compared stronger cyclones to the total number of cyclones. But this did not tell us the entire story of what was going on. You can see some years there's fluctuations within the amount of stronger cyclones and the total number of storms that were detected. So we decided to compare them on a bar graph. You can see on some years, a majority of the cases were intense cyclones, while some years they barely saw any systems less than 990 millibars or less, but this did not paint the entire picture we were looking for. So storm composites and linear regression were needed to really understand what was going on. So for our storm composites, it, we decided to take all of the storms from one year, center them, and average it per season. So we did that from the fall of 79 through the spring of 2021. And you can see these two images, we plotted three main things. The one being the mean sea level pressure, which is outlined in white on our isobars. The second one being temperature and the wind speed. On the image on your right, you can see a much more intense pressure gradient, which essentially means there's a tighter packing of the lines together. While on your left in 1980, it's a little bit less intense, the total averages as the lines are further apart but this still does not tell us the entire story of why to, of examining the intensity and frequency of these storms. So linear regression was finally performed using all of our data. On the image on your left is the total number of cyclones in the region. It shows a slight decrease. However, there is no significant trend over time in the total amount of cyclones in the region. It's statistically insignificant. And that was a similar story for the number of strong cyclones. You can see it looks like it's increasing over time. However, if you take a look at the p-values in both cases, it's statistically insignificant for the overall trend and strong cyclones. And now breaking that down even further, further, what we were able to show was there was no significant trend in the intensity and frequency in winter storms. The next image on your right was made by my mentor, Dr. Abby Hudson and it measured the temperature, some of the mean sea level pressure, and precipitation. The mean sea level pressure shows a slight decrease. However, this is still statistically insignificant, and thus proving that there's no significant trend over time in cyclones in the region. However, despite that, we were able to conclude that there are sharp increases in temperature and precipitation in the Great Lakes region. And, that, and we need to understand why this is happening. So further research is needed to examine changes in the frequency and intensity of these storms. I would be really interested to see what are some of the more local impacts of mesoscale events, and also focusing in why the mean sea level pressure shows a slight decrease, even though it's statistically significant, and also focusing in on changes in our precipitation. With that, I would like to wrap my presentation up if anyone has any questions. Thank you. Great job, thank you so much, Ryan. And um, for the audience, please uh, 
enter your questions in the question box or feel free to raise your hand. Uh, Philip Chu has our first question. He says, thanks, those are all great presentations and very good work. Just wondering if, oh, just wondering if PowerPoint's presentations will be made available later. And yes, uh, we will have the presentation recordings on the Sigler website. Um, some point, uh, it takes Aubrey, Aubrey um, separates out this big, you know, four hour long video uh, that we're recording here and splices out all of the fellows presentations and she will put those up on the website. It'll probably take her a little bit of time to get that done, um, but those will be on the Sigler website. Uh, let's see, uh, Gia has his hand up. Gia, I'm gonna unmute you. Or, yep, there you go. Okay, thank you. Uh... Look like the mean sea level pressure decrease over time. So that means we are going to see more cyclone than anticyclone in the future or the present time. Yes, yeah, so what we were able to find towards the end with that, I'm gonna show you the last image here, which does a very good job of showing that. What we were able after performing linear regression and examining the frequency, after when we did statistical analysis of the mean sea level pressure, it showed a slight decrease. However, it was still statistically insignificant, so we were unable to point one way or another, if that makes sense. All right, because uh, if, if the mean uh, sea level pressure decrease, when a uh, cyclone, uh, well, Pass by this region, it will be intensified. However, if uh, anticyclone pass by this region, it will be reduced. Uh, will be reduced. So this is what I, I I mean. That is a likely to see more cyclone occurring in our region than anticyclone. Yeah, that's what we need to determine next. That's a very good question, and I think we talked. My mentors and I talked about it at the meeting, especially since we've seen a warming uh, during our winter times in the winter and overall temperatures and have increased and also the ice amounts have decreased. East overall frequency, we were, if you look at the previous slide, I'm gonna show everybody that we weren't able to find a strong significant trend. It was still to statistically insignificant, but this still warrants further analysis research into what is going on in that region. And I would be interested to see in a couple of years if we could get to that point. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Our next question is from David Cannon. And David says, great presentation. Uh, I'm not sure it's pronounced ERA5 or ERA5, uh, but this recently extended their historical reanalysis to 1950. Do you think it's worth re-looking at the trends using more data? Absolutely, that was pretty recent. The ERA-5 just added that. I think it would be really interesting to go back to 1950, just to see the past 70 years and how that has changed. I would be very intrigued if someone did that in the future. Great, thanks for that question, David. Do we have any other questions for Ryan? And if not for Ryan, if there are any other um, questions that someone came up with for any speakers, we do have a few minutes we can address those too. 